Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as already announced, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that is very different from anything we've heard before and what is typically done in uh, this CH activation center. That has to do with uh, heterogeneous catalysis. And as you will see, many of our problems are pretty similar, but the approach is very different. So I very much appreciate the opportunity to reach out to this community and I certainly welcome feedback or uh, ideas in how we can move forward. So we're going to talk about the conversion of alkanes to olefins. And I want to remind you how we actually make olefins at the moment. And I'm not talking about sophisticated uh, molecules like we have seen in previous talks. We have great difficulties making C3 molecules, not to mention the larger molecules uh, that some of you are working on. And so typically, we make ethylene, propylene, butenes in a process called steam cracking from NAFTA. That's a fraction coming from an oil refinery. So there is no uh, ethylene mine in Africa or so. So this is how we make these small olefins. So feedstock is extremely important here. And so recently, the exploration of shale gas is really a game changer, especially in the United States, and how we're going to make those building block chemicals. And so a typical composition of shale gas is shown here. There's a lot of methane. Many of you are trying to use methane uh, for uh, making useful molecules. There's ethane, propane, and other uh, alkanes present in uh, shale gas. And what many companies now have done is uh, change their steam crackers not to use naphtha as a feedstock, but ethane as a feedstock, because they predominantly are interested in ethylene to make polyethylene, the most important plastic on earth, basically. And so that's, of course, a brilliant strategy to optimize ethylene yields. So the arrow size here in this figure illustrates the product selectivities or yields coming out of the steam cracker depending on the feedstock. Now, as you can clearly see, if you crack ethane, a C2 molecule, you're not going to make a lot of C3 and C4 olefins anymore. And so this leads to a... Uh, increasing gap between the uh, demand for propylene and the supply. So these bar graphs here show um, the amount of propylene that is produced through uh, traditional technology like steam cracking and fluid catalytic cracking and the red line uh, is the demand. So at the moment there is a demand for about a hundred million uh, uh, tons per year of propylene. And so people are trying to close that gap by so-called on-purpose production technologies. So not producing propylene as a byproduct in cracking, where you're mainly targeting ethylene, but really building a plant that's going to make you propylene. And so there is a handful of technologies available at the moment, uh, which is summarized here in the left lower corner, catafin, oloflex, and so on. So these are dehydrogenation technologies, where you take propane, you plug off hydrogen to make the olefin. And uh, all of these technologies suffer from similar uh, difficulties. Uh, the most popular one is Oloflex based on platinum. Catafin technology is based on a chromium catalyst. And just that you appreciate the scale, this is one reactor that goes in a typical catafin process. And so typically a plant producing propylene in a catafin process has 10 of those reactors. Because you need some reactors that are doing the job some reactors, they are regenerating the catalyst because the catalyst deactivates really rapidly. This is an endothermic reaction. You go to really high temperature. The catalyst is constantly deactivating due to the formation of a carbon layer on the surface called coking. And so you constantly need to burn off that coke layer. Um, so this uh, summarizes here, this slide, the difference between this current technology that is being used is propane dehydrogenation chemistry and oxidative dehydrogenation where you're going to co-feed oxygen and instead of making hydrogen in an endothermic process you're now going to make water as a co-product and do an, an exothermic oxidation uh, basically so what are some advantages and disadvantages of both so already mentioned with this dehydrogenation technology that you get very rapid catalyst deactivation. And you constantly need to burn out the carbon. So that leads to very high operational costs, obviously. 
It's also equilibrium limited, so there's an equilibrium reaction. So many companies operate at reduced pressure to shift the equilibrium to the products, which is, of course, expensive. So co-feeding oxygen could eliminate many of these uh, challenges in the sense that you uh, eliminate these thermodynamic restrictions, uh, favorable thermodynamics, and you eliminate the need for catalyst regeneration because you do no longer deposit carbon on your catalyst surface. And you make the reaction exothermic. So instead of having a monstrous process that consumes a lot of energy, this process is actually producing energy. So a while ago, I gave a similar talk to uh, managers in the company, and they asked me if I could do an oxidative dehydrogenation that still produces hydrogen. Well, that's, of course, a problem uh, <laughs> that relates to what we call thermodynamics. <laughs> But it seems that recently facts are not as important as what you believe in. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, that doesn't work. And so the challenge from a scientific point of view with ODH is selectivity. So this is what we share, basically. The homogeneous and heterogeneous CH uh, community is how do you stop at the molecule that you want? And so the moment that you're able to take propane to propylene that now features allylic hydrogens, it's very easy to over-oxidize it to CO and CO2. Now, the market for CO2 is relatively small. Uh, <laughs> it was actually high in Europe a while ago, so producing beer for the uh, World Cup. Um, by the way, if there are people from France dialing in, you have to hang up now because uh, Belgium lost against France. Uh, not happy about this. So what this... Uh, the diagram on the right hand axis shows you is selectivity versus conversion. And so the slope, so you see a decline in selectivity as you increase the conversion. The slope here signifies consecutive burning of the propylene. The intercept signifies a direct byproduct or route to byproducts coming directly from propane. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. So the state of the art catalysts here are based on vanadium and give you about 60% selectivity at 15-20% conversion. So that's certainly not enough by any means to replace dehydrogenation technology or to compete with steam cracking, for instance. So my group, we spent quite a bit of time looking at this vanadium-based catalyst and how we could enhance dispersion to maximize the active site density, understanding materials chemistry, how we make those materials. And then a uh, while ago, uh, two years back or so, Joe Grant in the group was studying this vanadium catalyst, and so and just for the general audience here, I include a figure how we do this. So we uh, structure our catalyst in a plug flow reactor that we put inside the reactor. And so as the reaction is exothermic, I told Joe to dilute his vanadium catalyst with silicon carbide, that's a heat conductor, uh, to avoid hot spots. So if you want to do nice kinetics, of course, but you don't want this local heating in your catalyst that you do the exothermicity. Joe, uh, so Joe thought, well, if that's an important variable, I'm going to try some other thermal conductors and silicon carbide. And amongst many, he also tried boron nitride. And so in the blank experiment, where the results are shown on this slide, Joe observed that about 500 C propane conversions of 70% with 77% propylene selectivity. So compare that to the 60% selectivity at 50 percent conversion. Well, that's significantly better already. And this was the first attempt for the first time he observed his activity. Um, nobody really expected this. Boron nitride is notoriously known for its inert properties. You make chemical reactors inert with it, storage vessels inert. If you try to oxidize it in oxygen, you have to go above 800 C to oxidize it. So it's generally considered to be inert. So nobody would in my appreciation, I've anticipated that this would be an oxidation catalyst. Uh, so this is uh, why we moved on and, and uh, published these results in science. But then uh, I want to draw your attention to this figure, which shows you the product selectivity obtained with a typical vanadium-based catalyst at 6% arbitrary conversion, 6% conversion, so X stands for conversion. As you can see, you get about 70% selectivity to propylene with the most important byproducts being CO and CO2. So about a quarter of your products is CO and CO2, not very desired. So if you compare now this 
hexagonal boronitride catalyst selectivity at the same selective at the same conversion of six percent. So if they always compare oxidations at either conversion levels, you get about uh, uh, ninety-one percent uh, selectivity to propylene. But the most important byproduct here is not CO CO two but ethylene. And ethylene is the largest scale. Uh, building block in the petrochemical industry. So your byproduct is actually valuable instead of being CO2 and uh, CO. So, uh, of course, you are a little bit skeptic when a student shows you this result. So I asked Joe and other students in the group to repeat this with uh, different reactor setups, different GCs, different GC columns, completely different setups, different materials with different impurities from different suppliers. And they all give very similar selectivity and conversion uh, trends. So this seems to be uh, quite a robust uh, discovery here. So I'm coming back to this figure showing olefin selectivity versus conversion that I showed you before with here uh, these uh, black symbols being uh, the uh, literature references. And the red and the orange data points on this figure are the propylene selectivities obtained with hexagonal boronitride and boronitride nanotubes, just like with carbon, uh, graphene, you have also nanotubes with boronitride. So very similar selectivity. And the blue data points here is the sum in selectivity to propylene and ethylene. So as you can see, this eliminates this y-intercept. So the most important uh, byproduct or, or site reaction of low conversion seems to be the breaking of CC bonds, making ethylene. Juan Venegas in the group went on and he also studied this catalyst for other substrates, amongst others, C4 and butane, isobutane. I'm going to spend too much time. You find similar improvements in selectivity as we found for uh, propane, similar trends also for uh, ethane. <clears throat> Will McDermott in the group then investigated the influence of oxygen and hydrocarbon partial pressure on the selectivity. So, on the right hand side of this figure I show product selectivity versus the partial pressure of propane. Nothing exciting, there is no influence on the selectivity. On the left-hand figure here, you see that at low oxygen partial pressures, your selectivity towards the desired olefins are dropping very rapidly, falling down to zero. So under oxygen starvation conditions, the CC bond cleavage or cracking channel becomes much more important. Now, people with a fetish for kinetics like myself, they really recognize immediately that there is kinetic competition here for your desired channel going to olefins or undesired cracking reactions. So we're trying to figure out what are these two competing reaction mechanisms because if you're able to switch off the cracking selectivity, your selectivity would drastically improve. So we're very happy also to observe that other people are able to reproduce these results for various substrates and they all come to the same conclusion as a stable catalyst that did time on steam experiments. So they put it in a reactor for two, three weeks and it remains stable. So it seems to be a pretty robust catalyst. So then we went on and we made different materials, different boronitride materials with different surface areas. So heterogeneous catalysis people, they like to play with specific surface area. So these are the numbers between brackets. So 16 square meter per gram for a commercial boronitride, slow surface area. You can make materials with uh, 800 or even more than 1,000 square meter per gram, which are basically materials that allow you to play football on a handful of materials. And so what I plot here is conversion of the alkane versus the inverse weight tower space velocity. That's a measure that chemical engineers use for contact time. And so the slope of these uh, plots here signify the, uh, <clears throat> the reaction rate. So it tells you how much propane is converted per kilogram of catalyst per second. And as you can see, increasing the surface area of the boron nitride does lead to some improvements in the reaction rate. However, all of a sudden, this 540 square meter per gram material has a higher performance than the 850 square meter per gram material. So surface area is not uh, the only parameter that is important. 
Now, of course, people working at palaces appreciate this for a long time, that it's most often not the straight surface of the material, but edges and corners and defect sites that are the sweet spots that you want. So if you look at boron nitride shown here, you have both armchair edges and zigzag edges on this material. And based on literature from the material science community, we argued that armchair edges would be more exposed under these conditions. So we went on and see how we can activate oxygen on those armchair edges. So that's uh, figure A here. Other people in the literature, they do agree that oxygen needs to be activated on the material, and they proposed either uh, oxygen activation on this uh, uh, zigzag edges, figure C, or hydroxylated sites in the, uh, in the middle of the figure here. Either way, there is a consensus that you need some sort of oxygen on the surface. And so using periodic boundary calculations, you're able to close a catalytic cycle that somehow energetically makes sense, can explain our observed productivities and so on. And we thought, well, fantastic, we have a catalytic cycle, what more do you want? Now, Juan Venegas performed an experiment uh, where he also tested other borides. And as we can see, cobalt borate, hamnium borate, you name it, they all follow the same selectivity trend as boronitride. So again, the solid symbols here are uh, the selectivity to propylene, the open symbols are selectivity to propylene plus ethylene combined. We also tried different nitrides, so for instance, uh, titanium nitride here, they're also active, but by far not as selective. So all these different borides up here give you similar selectivity, but different reactivity. So again, if I plot this conversion versus contact time, you see that they have different reaction rates. So that's summarized in this table here. So whether you express the rate per kilogram of material or per surface area per square meter, exposed uh, catalyst surface, you see that there are vast differences between them, which we do not understand. Recently, reviewers said, well, this obviously is due to the fact that these are single site catalysts. Well, I don't understand this. Uh, <laughs> I do not see how you can conclude this from these data. Um, we did make single site catalysts in the meantime, and they're actually not active. We'll come back to that at a later stage. What is really remarkable is that all these materials are obviously electronically and structurally very, very different. Okay, so why would they have the same selectivity? So we decided to do some uh, spectroscopy, and so Sam Burt here decided to do XPX, uh, X-ray uh, photoelectron spectroscopy. What you observed is a trend, if you look at the pristine catalyst versus the spent catalyst, you see that the material, the surface of the material gets oxidized. So the boron gets surrounded by oxygen atoms, oxidize the surface boron atoms. That's what you can conclude from XPS, basically. Similar conclusions from Raman spectroscopy, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. You see similar signals coming like you have in boron oxide and boric acid, but it's actually not overlapping with boric acid and boron oxide. So uh, we decided to do some more sophisticated uh, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And uh, uh, for boron, you need soft X-rays. So uh, we needed to travel to Berkeley with the advanced light source. And so what you, what uh, uh, this can uh, teach us here is if you compare the boron k edge spectrum on the left-hand side of the figure, so in the south of the figure, you have boron oxide and boric acid reference spectra, and the fresh catalyst and the spent catalyst. What you observe is in the spent catalyst, you see boron with three oxygen atoms surrounding the boron. Whereas in the fresh pristine boronite, that you only have boron surrounded by three nitrogen atoms. But clearly, whatever you make on this material is different from boron oxide, <laughs> and boric acid. Same conclusion if we study the oxygen K-H. So, well, this is really remarkable. So we decided to turn to NMR spectroscopy, which is worked by Alyssa Love. And so one of the problems with boron NMR is that this is a quadrupolar nucleus, which gives rise to these really complicated line shapes. 
So all these spectra that you see here are simulated spectra for single boron nuclei. The only difference is their uh, symmetry, their molecular arrangement. So this ETA parameter basically gives you information on the molecular environment. You could say, well, this is annoying, or you could say that's brilliant because the precise uh, structure of the signals that we get contains atomistic information on what is around this boron atom, which is really cool if you want to try to understand what is going on. Just, I'm going to show you a few uh, results here in the interest of time. So in the fresh hexagonal boron nitride, we just observed one signal corresponding to boron surrounded by three nitrogens. On the spent catalyst, we all of a sudden see an additional signal coming from boron surrounded by three oxygen atoms, which uh, chemical engineers are lazy, so I just put BO3. Uh, that's just an abbreviation of what, what the LRB is. I'll come back to this in a second. Now, where do you read the isotropical chemical shift of such a, a quadripolarly broadened uh, signal is not in the middle of the signal, but where the signal starts, basically. So what we can clearly conclude from this already is that this oxidized boron phase that you form on a spent catalyst is not boron oxide. Okay, one other word of, of warning here is if you look at this spent spectrum, it appears like a lot of the boron nitride is converted to boron oxide. That's a wrong conclusion. So when we recorded the spectrum, we did not realize yet that the T1 relaxation for boron nitride is very, very long. It's something like 150 seconds, which is something we didn't anticipate. So if you want to do a uh, same quantitative boron in a market, you really need to check your T1 time. In reality, actually, only about 20 to 30 percent of your boron nitride is oxidized. I'm going to show you this later. I want to show you that if you use boron carbide, you see a very similar uh, effect, where in a spent catalyst you form new species which correspond to oxidized boron, which again are not boron oxide. So we went into more detail, and I'm, I, in the interest of time, I cannot go into too much detail, but we did uh, same quantitative spin echo experiments where we identified the different overlapping signals via boron boron uh, multi quantum uh, magic angle spinning spectroscopy so where you can really deconvolute overlapping signals in the lower left corner here. You can really fit them get those parameters out and use those carefully determined parameters to then fit a spin echo experiment. You get really quantitative information on the distribution of sites that you have. You can also figure out, of course, which one of these borons contain protons or no protons based on inept and dephase experiments and so on, or, or um, HMQC experiments. So you can really say this signal corresponds to boron with three nitrogens. This is with two, with three oxygens. These borons are in the proximity of protons. These are not in the proximity of protons. And um, really start to build a picture, a molecular picture of what the surface of this material looks like. And coming back to this spectrum here in the upper left corner, the spin echo spectrum, where you clearly see that the amount of oxidized boron is really only about 20% at most on what you form on these materials. Yet this is a very different picture from what everyone in the literature believed so far that we would just decorate the surface of or the edges of boron nitride with some oxygen atoms like OH groups or some uh, chemisorb oxygen molecules. You really oxyfunctionalize the surface of boron nitride at temperatures far below where you would typically oxidize boron nitride without the presence of a hydrocarbon. And we believe this is a crucial discovery in trying to build a consistent reaction mechanism. So all we can say so far is that on the surface of your boron nitrate or whatever borite, uh, your favorite borite, is that you have a oxidized boron layer, B-O-H-X-O-Y, that is capable of oxidizing alkane to olefin in a rather selective way. We're trying to figure out what is the channel to cracking, to minimize the cracking channel, but that's work in progress. So we thought if boron, oxidized boron support is what you need, why don't we try to mobilize boron silica, 
and that's what Jean in the group did. So she impregnated a uh, silica boron with a boron precursor here, designed it, made the boron silica material very easy, obviously easier or cheaper to make than a boron nitride catalyst. And guess what? This also works. So this again is our favorite selectivity versus conversion plot, comparing uh, vanadium catalyst with this boron silica catalyst. So significantly more selective than vanadium on uh, support materials, slightly less selective than boron nitrite or other borides, but clearly belonging to the same family of materials where the selectivity does not drop off as fast as a function of conversion compared to previously studied materials. So we really think we're on the right track here to understand what is going on. So what are the lessons learned? And this is especially a message for the graduate students. If someone would have come to my office and said, if I want to study boron nitrate as an oxidation catalyst, I for sure would have said, well, that's a complete waste of your time. So the message to the students is do not listen to your advisor, <laughs> <laughs> but do more. So if you feel, that a certain variable, a certain parameter is really important in your system, study what the influence is. And so, um, Pasteur's favorite saying is, the luck uh, favors the prepared mind. And so, by having students that carefully evaluate crucial variables in their system and systematically investigate the influence of those variables, I hope that this is a way forward and to really make progress and to uh, discover new chemistries and then try to understand what is behind it to then uh, further improve them in a more directed or rational way. So I hope I give you a flavor of how in my group we try to look at catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis done from various angles, making materials, doing kinetics, studying the mass transfer, heat transfer, and so on in those systems. Uh, spectroscopy, various techniques, tools that are needed, trying to figure out what is actually happening with that material under these rather harsh conditions. We also do theory, trying to uh, better understand what is going on or to formulate working hypotheses that we can go and test in the lab. So I hope that this gives you a bit of a flavor of the problems that heterogeneous catalysis people are dealing with. During the talk, I already acknowledged most of the people that actually contributed to this project. I'm really honored to work with extremely bright people. Uh, I also need to thank various organizations that uh, were kind enough to donate money to do this research. And uh, well, thank you all for your attention. I'll try to uh, answer questions that you may have.